Tales from a Jurassic World, Season 2, Episode 1, Howard King. This is Bravo 4 to Field Team. Expedition leader is en route to landing site. ETA 5 mics to landing site. Approaching via the northeast approach vector now. Bravo 5 and Bravo 6 have been dispatched to Southwest Beach to collect Capture 1's assets. Capture lead, please prepare to bring Expedition lead up to speed on arrival. Over. The sleek, curved shape of a Tan Sikorsky S-76 flew above aggressive ocean waves as it drew closer and closer towards the towering, jagged shapes of cliffs rising in the distance. As the helicopter got closer to the cliffs, it began to rise sharply, giving a brief glimpse at a small and barren clearing atop the cliff as the vehicle began to pick up speed and glide over the thick vegetation of the island below. As it continued to fly across the island, a large clearing appeared underneath the vehicle. Trees and bushes trodden down to create a large dirt path for animals several times larger than anything seen elsewhere in the world. The scale of the island was truly something to behold, with several distinct ecosystems interwoven into one comprehensive structure. As the helicopter continued to glide through the skies, it came over a small compound of uniquely shaped structures, including what appeared to be large warehouse type buildings, buildings with communications towers, and structures of all shapes and descriptions. The sprawling facility was moss covered and dilapidated, clearly a relic from a bygone era. As clearly as it had appeared, it began to disappear as the helicopter descended into the foliage. In front of the helicopter sat a sprawling landing strip, accompanied by a couple of barren buildings which were either side of the landing pad. The landing pad itself was old, but some new architecture had been set up with makeshift fencing, watchtowers and field tents dotted around the location. A couple more vehicles were already landed at the airstrip, including a pair of large dual-rotor Boeing CH-47 Chinook helicopters. Off-road vehicles were busy moving around the site, including some heavily modified Land Rover Discoveries which boasted heavier rims, rugged storage racks on their roofs, external storage slots for jerry cans, and also thick metal meshing across their windows. The scale of the operation was something which had clearly had a lot of money invested in it, and the diversity of the vehicles present was quite something to behold. As the helicopter came to a stop on the ground, the cargo bay door slid open and a man stepped out, walking towards another person who was sprinting towards him in what appeared to be black combat fatigues. As the door closed behind the man, a white logo which read Biosyn could be clearly read. Mr. King, welcome to Isla Sorna. The man in combat fatigues called. I'm O'Brien, capture lead on the ground. We've had a busy couple of days so far. If you want to follow me, I can bring you up to speed. King, who was dressed in a tan safari shirt with a pair of khaki cargo trousers and black combat boots, began to follow the man into the camp as they walked past other similarly equipped people, loading up supplies, checking maps of the island, and also preparing what appeared to be tranquilizer rifles. We've been successful in rounding up several of the animals from the initial list Dodson was able to acquire from his engine contact. We decided to round up the two Rexes which we knew were local to this region first, given the US Navy report about encounters with them. They've already been shipped off towards the Dolomites. We couldn't find the juvenile from the report, but we still have teams scouring the island. Good work. Dodson will be pleased about the Rexes. We only have a few days on the island. We paid off Lieutenant Harris to keep some of the naval patrols away from the restricted zone, but even he only has so much pull. Have you had any luck tracking down the Velociraptors? The man came to a stop and turned, looking directly at King. We've been able to capture some of them, but there's more of them on the island than we initially thought. Appears to be different packs of them, some with tiger stripes and some with darker skin and quills on their heads. There isn't any consistency to where we've encountered them, but they definitely appear to be breeding in the wild. I've lost seven men while attempting to contain them. Don't worry about the deaths. Dodson will make sure their families are compensated so none of this makes it out. 
I was reading over your report on the helicopter over, and I noted you mentioned another inconsistency about the species on the island. Yes. There are animals which weren't on engines list. We were able to find a couple of different Corythosaurus which we have already contained and put on the ship. While our teams were investigating one of the lab sites, we also found a couple of Microceratus. We believe they were due to be bred for the original park on Nublar, but never realized they got as far as hatching them. Interesting. King put a finger to his chin, deep in thought, and then looked across the camp towards the gate. I was initially going to visit for an update on your progress, but perhaps it's prudent of me to visit the laboratory myself. Can you take me there? Of course, sir. Let me grab a couple of my men and we can take a trip down there. Most of the engine facility has already been secured by my teams, but with an island this scale, there is no telling when new dinosaurs will appear. We'll be ready within ten minutes. Very good. King said, motioning for the man to go and prepare. He proceeded to walk into one of the tents and started to pick through some paperwork which had been left atop a cabinet unit inside. As he flicked through, he realised he was looking at an in-gen field guide, describing some of the animals which were on the island. He had seen these when Dodgson had first acquired them from his contact at Palo Alto, but having them printed and used in the field was quite something else to behold. Interestingly, the document listed that some Compsognathus and Gallimimus had already been captured from the island, alongside a pair of Stegosaurus and their juvenile. King was aware they would have to move quickly. It had been four years since InGen was acquired by Masrani Global, and spies within Timak Construction had confirmed that construction on their new project, Jurassic World, would begin any day now. There was a lot of speculation that Masrani Global would soon begin to use Isla Sauna as a factory floor of sorts for the new attraction, repurposing assets left on the island for their new park. If Biosyn were going to acquire any of the dinosaurs then it had to be done now, before the islands were too closely guarded to access. As he began to flick through more pages, he found some interesting notes from Biosyn operatives out in the field, referencing new animals including a large theropod with a sail on its back. It looked like some had speculated that it may have been a baryonyx, but encounters with the animal had been so fleeting that no formal identification could take place. Interestingly, the US naval documents which King had got his hands on following Alan Grant's excursion on the island did not provide any detail around this animal, despite the operative's notes stating that it was incredibly aggressive and confrontational. King began to ponder this when O'Brien returned into the tent, followed by three other men kitted out in combat equipment. One of the men carried a tranquilizer rifle, whilst the other two were equipped with rifles and were loaded with additional magazines on their combat webbing. Ready? Yes, I think I am. Let's get moving. King followed the group of operatives down to a pair of Land Rover defenders, which were waiting next to a gate which led onto a pathway through the forest. He climbed into the back of the front defender with O'Brien and one of the operatives, whilst the other two men climbed into the vehicle behind them. They gunned their vehicles into life and another man in matching uniform opened the gate for them, allowing the vehicles to roll through into the luscious tropical forest beyond. Birds could be heard chirping in the forest around them, but there appeared to be relatively little activity from the dinosaurs in the local area, suggesting to King that the activity on the island had made a mark on the local ecosystem. He looked at O'Brien, sat in the front seat. The behavioural patterns of the animals on the island seem pretty inconsistent with what I would expect. Any idea what caused that? Yep. O'Brien replied, motioning to a large dome structure on the horizon which came into view as the vehicle briefly passed through a clearing and continued along the muddy route. Pteranodons escaped from the aviary when people were on the island in 01. It caused chaos and disrupted a lot of the migration patterns. The field scientists you brought over have been finding it fascinating to study. Interesting. I was also reading about another animal. A baryonyx, it seems. Any encounters with that? 
We managed to capture that one just before you arrived. A lot of debate about whether it's a baryonyx or a spinosaurus. Scientists can't seem to agree. It's being prepped for transit back to the facility in Italy. Should have a cargo plane arriving after you leave. We've got one more airlift to complete and then the rest of the animals can be loaded on the cargo ship you arrived from. Good work, O'Brien. These assets are going to help propel our work forwards by decades. No more skulking around the mines looking for amber samples after this. Those tunnels are going to be extinct. Heh. <laughs> I never much liked it down there anyway. Always gave me the creeps. As the vehicles continued to traverse the muddy landscape of the forest roads, eventually the convoy broke through into a large clearing, the space in front of them directly absorbed by a large metal and glass building which now sat, eroded by years of vegetation growth. A sign which read InGen could still be barely read in front of the building, and the outside area, which had presumably been the car park at one point in time, was littered with abandoned vehicles and debris. One of the vehicles, a green jeep which now sat rotten and eroded, appeared slightly more modern, suggesting to King that this hadn't been here originally, but rather was part of the expedition which had found themselves on the island in 1997. Whatever the true story was, it was fair to say that the structure in front of them now sat quiet and abandoned, scarcely hinting at the secrets which were hidden within. As the team of Biosyn operatives began to dismount their vehicles, the two men with rifles quickly began to set up a perimeter around the area, scanning the shrubbery around them for any signs of activity. King stepped forward, taking a moment to take in the structure in front of them. For many years, Dodgson had lectured him about how ahead of their time InGen were, constantly going on about his failed attempts to steal their technological advancements over the years. It was surreal to see a company which had once been the epitome of competition within the biological sciences sector now in such a state of disrepair. King had no doubt that Simon Masrani would bring the company back from the brink, but it was fascinating to see a company on the edge of technological brilliance in such a state of vulnerability. As he took the structure in, O'Brien walked up to his side. A lot of interesting stuff in this building. We think the raptors were using this and the worker village on the south of the island as nesting locations. Different packs at different locations. If we had more time, I'm sure your teams could get some interesting insight into what was going on here. There's definitely something strange about the populations on this island. That much is for sure. There's a lot I'd like to understand if we had more time, but for now, this laboratory will have to do. Can you guide me to it? Sure thing. Follow me. The group slowly crept into the facility in front of them stepping over broken glass and pushing their way through vegetation as they made entry into the building. Inside, the reception area of the building was a mess, with desks littered with debris and with the sunlight piercing through the rooftop in different areas where the roof had fallen away entirely. Vines were wrapped around the walls and hung from the rafters. Paintings which had once decorated the walls were now faded and blurred. In the corridors beyond the entrance, more signs of the distress the building had endured could be found. Vending machines sat, covered in grime with the glass in one smashed and broken, and dirt was smeared across the walls. As the group continued down the corridor, they eventually broke free into a large, cavernous room, the embryonic laboratory. Emerging at the top of some steep stairs, they pushed down into the depths of the room, which was littered with mechanical equipment. Wow, it's huge. One of the men stuttered, taking the space in front of him in. Keep your heads on a swivel, boys. As they moved deeper into the facility, the true scale of the room before them became clear. Large incubator units sat, long since abandoned, with rugged metal arms looming above them ready to tend to young dinosaurs. Cables, 
pipes and mechanical equipment littered the walls, and in the rows beyond where the incubator unit sat, glass containers of every size could be found, filled with embryonic fluid. Some of the incubators contained cracked and broken eggs, and some of the embryonic chambers contained the embryos of dinosaurs, monitoring equipment still attached to their long deceased forms. The scale of the facility was awe-inspiring. It was clear InGen had been undertaking a massive operation on this island. Further into the facility, they came across another room, marked as Hatchery. The door which had once kept this room separate from the main floor of the large laboratory had fallen through, and one of the large windows which looked out onto the factory floor was smashed, vines now growing through with frightening ferocity. King stepped into the laboratory, followed by O'Brien. The room in front of them featured a couple of small incubators and several metal workbenches, with a dinosaur fossil engraved into one wall. The square panelling of the rooftop had collapsed in places, allowing rubble and natural growth to spill into the room. An overturned metal chair lay on the floor in the middle of the room, and smashed vials and scientific equipment were strewn across the floor. Here and there, small indicators of humanity stood out amidst the debris, like a faded Rubik's Cube which was now broken into several pieces scattered across the floor, or a sodden box of Twinkies. As King walked further into the room, he noticed a cold storage container which had now rusted, and some paperwork next to it, signed by somebody known as Lockwood. The name was vaguely familiar to him, but he didn't think it was significant enough to read through any further. As he worked his way around the desks further, he came to a computer console in the corner of the room. The screen itself was mouldy and broken, but some of the paper notes around it were fascinating. As he picked up one of the folders, titled Site B Next Steps, he began to realise that he was reading through notes written by Dr Henry Wu, the chief geneticist from the original park. The notes were fascinating, explaining how Wu had been experimenting with new species, including a Spinosaurus and a Ceratosaurus on the island, and it went on to explain how the Spinosaurus had inspired him to think more about hybridisation within the animals, something which he felt John Hammond would never sanction. King closed the folder and scooped up the other paperwork on the desk, placing it into a satchel at the side of his shirt. He turned back to O'Brien, who was still stood in the doorway. We found the microceratus in a hatchery just down there, he said, motioning back down the corridor in the main room. Good. I think we just found a gold mine. As they went to leave the laboratory, there was a commotion outside the room. O'Brien and King exited, and realised that the three operatives they had with them were now face to face with two new men who had clearly appeared from deeper within the facility. The men were wearing combat fatigues which were a mix of greens and browns, and their name tags clearly identified them as US Navy. Although they weren't fully equipped in battle uniform, both wore belts and had holsters on their hips which appeared to hold pistols within them. Both men had their hands in the air and appeared nervous, with the two Biosyn operatives holding rifles, levelling them at the soldiers. As O'Brien and King walked out, the men turned to look at them, clearly apprehensive. What are you doing here? One of them demanded. This area is off limits. We've got orders to turn anyone here over to the authorities. The other added. We're here as part of the Maserani Global Project. We were dispatched to check potential landing sites on the island. Didn't Lieutenant Harris mention it to you? The soldiers looked at them for a minute, weighing them up. Eventually, one of them spoke. If you're with Masrani Global, then why do the Land Rovers out there say Biosyn? We're working in partnership, helping to recon the island for them. O'Brien replied. Bullshit! I'm calling this in! The soldier said, reaching for a radio. 
One of the soldiers went to reach down to his belt, but one of the Biosyn operatives stepped forward, knocking him to the floor with a swift swing from the butt of his rifle. He then levelled the barrel at the man again as he sprawled on the floor. What the hell are you doing? O'Brien turned to King, who was watching the exchange unfold. What do you want to do? You heard Dodson. No one can know we've been here. Without so much as blinking, King reached down to a pocket on his cargo trousers, removed a pistol, and raised it at the man stood in front of him. He didn't even pause to acknowledge the man as he squeezed the trigger. Howard King jolted awake, the gunshot echoing through his mind as he dragged his hand over his eyes and rubbed them, slowly sitting up in the bed he was lying in. He looked across at the alarm which was sat on a cabinet next to the bed. 8am, 3rd of August 2021. He pulled himself out of the bed and crossed the room to his wardrobe, opening it to reveal a suit and tie. He pulled the suit on, wrapping the tie around his neck and arranging a knot in it before he walked over to the window which engulfed one side of the room that he was in. He pressed a red button to the side and the electronic blinds which had shrouded the room in darkness now opened, revealing the sprawling landscape in front of him. In front of him was Biosyn Valley, a stunning natural sanctuary encased within the Dolomite mountain range. In the distance he could see the sharp and jagged edges of mountains rising up to the side, connected on the horizon by the thin glint of metal which marked the artificial dam which Biosyn had constructed to block the frozen lake atop the mountain range. As the snow from the mountains faded, he could see rows and rows of luscious green trees and thick vegetation of every description, smothered only slightly by the thick morning fog which clung to the air. Here and there patches of water and rivers separated the tree line and the movement of observation watchtowers could be seen, raising and lowering themselves as the researchers inside studied the animals spread throughout the valley. King knew that some of the animals from his dream were out there too, the ones which had been kept at the Biosyn facility in the subsequent years. Of course, some had found new homes, but that was just part of the dino trade business which had popped up in the years after the Lockwood Manor incident. It was good to be home. King had spent months in the field. He'd been out there for the incident at Big Rock National Park and had also been sent to several incidents since then, all with the aim of containing the animals and bringing them under Biosyn's acquisition. Now that Congress had handed more power to the company, they were moving from strength to strength, but it meant that King spent less and less time at the Dolomites. He was pulled from his thoughts when there was a knock at the door and it opened to reveal a man stood in all black with slick, swept back hair. King recognised him immediately as Lewis Dodgson's personal security guard. He's in his office waiting on you. He has an update on that Hexapod Allies program now that Wu's on board. Ready when you are. King nodded, grabbing his phone from the cabinet and pulling the door shut as he closed it behind him and followed the man deeper into the facility eager to learn what Dodgson had been working on whilst he was gone. You have been listening to Tales from a Jurassic World. Howard King voiced by Antonio Bustos. Helicopter Pilot voiced by Tim Piper. O'Brien voiced by Bradley Nesbitt. O'Brien's Trooper, voiced by Ryan Rogers. US Navy Officer 1, voiced by Stephen Ray Morris. US Navy Officer 2, voiced by Mudshake07. Dodgson's Bodyguard, voiced by Travis Holland. Intro music by Brooks Leiby. Accompanying music from the Jurassic franchise and Jurassic World Evolution. Sound effects from Epidemic Sound. Written, created, and produced by Tom Jurassic. 
Tales from a Jurassic World follows the US Fish and Wildlife Service as they adapt to dinosaurs in the wild. <laughs> 